not the people population. It's the population of the domesticated animals that we are raising for food. We are facing some massive environmental problems right now. Everything from climate change to resource depletion, food insecurity, and they're all really big issues. Climate change has the potential to impact rising sea levels, extreme weather, and exacerbate resource depletion. So, I want to ask you, what is probably the number one thing you may have heard about what you can do in your personal lifestyle to mitigate your greenhouse gas emissions? Shop locally. Shop locally. What about <laughs> car drive? Yes, yeah, yes, that's the big one. Everyone talks about, you know, drive a Prius, bike, carpool. Interestingly, the transportation sector is responsible for only about 12 to 13 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So this includes trains, planes, cars, everything around the entire world. And animal agriculture, that is the meat and dairy products we are producing and consuming, contribute, depending on the source, between 18 to 51 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Cows globally produce 150 billion gallons of methane per day. And part of the reason this is so significant, even though we talk about CO2 so much, is methane is 86 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Grass-fed cattle, which is something you might hear about with the eat less beef, you know, eat more sustainable meat or local, Grass-fed cattle actually produce 50% more greenhouse gas emissions than grain-fed factory farmed cattle do. One to two acres of rainforest are cleared every single second. 91% of that destruction of the Amazon is actually coming from animal agriculture. Many of the trees that are being clear-cut are being used to produce paper, but they're not being cut down for paper originally. They're being cut down so we can graze grass-fed cattle and grow grain to feed cattle. 137 plant and animal species are lost every day as the rainforest is cut down. And currently, a third of the planet is now classified as desertified. Animal agriculture, according to the UN, is the leading driver of this desertification. Pollution, another big issue. Seven million pounds of excrement are produced per minute. In, uh, in the world. And we now have more than 500 nitrogen flooded dead zones in the ocean where no life can grow at all. And most of it is directly related and is around coastal areas where pollution from factory farms and animals and manure is running off into these oceans. <laughs> A single dairy farm with 2,500 cows produces the same amount of excrement as a city of 400,000 people. The UN currently estimates that about 1 billion people are malnourished um, and living with hunger, and about 2 billion people are eating primarily meat-based diets, while 4 billion people are eating primarily plant-based diets. Yet, animal agriculture globally is responsible for between 20 to 30 percent of all freshwater use. And of fresh water that's used in food production, it is responsible for more than 45% of that. So less than 40, less than 50% of people eating on this planet are eating primarily meat-based diets. But we're using most of the water in that way. 50% of grain globally is fed to animals. Imagine what we could do if that land that we were growing grain to feed animals was used to grow grain to directly feed people. <laughs> Put another way, 1.5 acres of land can produce 37,000 pounds of plant foods, or just 375 pounds of meat. Livestock today cover 45% of the Earth's land mass. The biomass 10,000 years ago was primarily free-living wild animals. Today, the majority is the domesticated animals that humans are raising for food. So this is important because many people talk about population as you know, that being the problem. We just have too many humans, so all of these environmental problems are going to continue. And that may be true, but we can likely support the population we currently have of people. The problem is not the people population. It's the population of the domesticated animals that we are raising for food. So let's look at what has gone on recently in our dietary trends that we're seeing such an increase in these environmental impacts. 
So total consumption of meat and dairy has increased drastically over the past 50 years. Global consumption of meat in particular increased from 47 million tons in 1950 to 260 million tons in 2005. That's about a five-fold increase when the population only doubled. And it's the affluent middle class in many developing countries that is largely driving this because consumption of animal products is heavily correlated with per capita income. Why, besides just directly price, is meat and dairy associated with the affluent middle class and growing income? So a historical analysis sort of looking at how people view meat and dairy shows the consumption of animal products has actually been very stratified. The poorest people in many areas of the world um, have not actually eaten or been able to consume as many animal products. One example is Brazil in the 1700s when Portuguese colonialists came over and opened up gold mining operations, which were very profitable during this time period. And they wanted to concentrate the wealth with their gold mines and didn't want anyone else in the region to have this wealth. And so they actually put a decree out that no one was allowed to raise animal products besides them. They didn't want beef in particular because they were worried that other people being allowed to raise animal products would spread the wealth. So when we have examples like this or other examples such as World War II when food is rationed, some of the first products to be rationed are the animal products. It becomes this specialty thing. And in many areas of the world, when consumption has been restricted or there's been limited access, Consumption is only, you know, it only happens at festivals and celebrations. And that also starts to build this community and culture around, oh, it's a good time, we have meat, we have dairy, we have these animal products. And that builds this mentality. You know, peasants historically were sort of the stew eaters. Well, the aristocrats have always been the ones that ate meat and dairy, and they were the meat eaters. So we see uh, meat and dairy consumption here becoming synonymous with wealth, monarchy, uh, even justice and freedom, especially when you have people coming out of poverty who have had restricted access, and when they suddenly feel like we can eat these, it's our choice, you know, we have the freedom, it's not, you know, we're not oppressed the way we used to be, our access is not restricted. I really like this quote from a social anthropologist who said, as with the food systems of every society on earth, we can understand our own diets only with reference to the deep-rooted beliefs by which we are taught to see the world. And I really like this, because to understand the symbolism and where it comes from a little bit more, I think we need to dig even deeper and understand what are the values that are driving our actions in society? What values do we hold, maybe even unconsciously, that we're not thinking about? So consumption of meat and dairy and this symbolism largely rose from an ethos of technology mm -hmm and income that came out of the industrial and scientific revolutions and the enlightenment. Because at that time, a lot of these ideas of bringing nature to heal, controlling nature, you know, civilizing people, all of these values were sort of what was being spread at that time. And survival of the fittest was one of the key points that came out of all of this. So animal products tie into this because when your values are survival of the fittest, control of nature, bringing nature to heal, what better way to show that than by actually eating the flesh of another being? There is no more you know, metaphorical way to authenticate your power. Well, that is showing your power over them, over nature. And it's largely this domination by humans of animals that actually allowed the elite humans to become more elite, to become the aristocrats. And they arose through dominating others. And this same ethos actually has a much bigger impact because the same ideas of survival of the fittest and these technological and scientific justifications continue to justify all sorts of other oppressions and injustice today. In particular, when you take the idea of survival of the fittest or who's the greatest race, that actually has perpetrated things like sexism and racism to a large part by using these arbitrary criteria or trying to scientifically say they're different than us, they're weaker, they're, you know, lesser, we're the more powerful. That's justified oppression. And we are using those same oppressions today to justify speciesism. We are discrediting the lives of animals because we believe they are different than us or not as valuable and can't talk. And like I mentioned the issues of food insecurity before, while much of the animal consumption and production is being justified 
um, as helping people, in reality, it's actually driving many of the environmental problems that are causing all of these. Unless and until we address and challenge this underlying ethos that is driving all of this, we're not going to see things really change. This is about way more than just diet. This is about the ethos of oppression and about dominating others and exploiting others. And I believe that we must question that if we want to change these things. The good news is I believe this ethos really is changing and people are beginning to reject the idea of survival of the fittest as a justification for things like racism and sexism and now speciesism. How many of you think of veganism and vegetarianism just as diets? It's, it's very popular. That's how the popular media portrays them. That's how most people talk about them. We can be vegan for many reasons. You know, vegan for health, vegan for ethics. Vegetarianism and veganism historically all stem from ethics. Vegetarian philosophy is truly ancient. Most major religions all share some form of the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And an idea of ethics in them. And many of these ethics, when you look closely, support vegetarian and veganism. Pythagoreans are the earliest recorded vegetarians who abstained just from eating flesh, as far as our accounts can tell. And in 1783, Louis Gompertz in England is one of the first recorded vegans that we actually know. He did not use that label, but by all accounts, he was an ethical vegan. Some of his writings actually led Bronson Alcott, who was the first um, person to actually use the label vegetarian. Interestingly, his use of the word vegetarian meant 100% vegan. He and some of his followers that uh, founded a school together rejected the use of all dairy and eggs, and they rejected the use of leather, and didn't want to use animals to even pull their plows or carts in the garden because they felt that was a form of slavery and exploitation. And they founded the first vegetarian society in England as well. But when it merged with the Bible Christian Church, who only abstained from eating flesh and even advocated the consumption of dairy and eggs, the meaning of vegetarianism sort of shifted, and that's when it really became more of just a diet that meant abstaining from flesh. In 1944, a lot of these discussions about whether dairy and eggs should be allowed came up again. Um, and a group of people who sort of called themselves the non-dairy vegetarians at that time led by two men, Donald Watson and Leslie Cross, founded the first vegan society. And I have a couple quotes from them because they're just some of my absolute favorites. And Leslie Cross wrote in 1951, the object of the society shall be to end the exploitation of animals by humans, and the word vegan shall mean the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals. And he went on to say, where other movements deal with a segment, and therefore deals directly with practices rather than principles. Veganism is itself a principle from which certain practices logically flow. And one last one from the article Veganism Defined, also by Leslie Cross. I really love this one. Veganism, in this light, veganism is not so much welfare as liberation for the creatures, for the mind and heart of man, uh, not so much an effort to make the present relationship bearable but an uncompromising recognition that because it is one of master and slave, it has to be abolished before something better and finer can be built. It possesses historical continuity with the movement that legally set <coughs> free the human slaves. The question I like to ask is if we can live happy and healthy lives without causing harm to others, why wouldn't we? And I believe that we can change this, and we can change the environmental problems and change the entangled oppressions by living our lives in a way that adopts a new ethos. So I invite all of you to join me in rejecting an ethos of violence and oppression and adopt a vegan ethic that I believe can change the world. Thank you. Thank you.